Let's start our discussion on decision traps and let's start it with a couple of questions. Is the population of Turkey greater than 35 million? And what is your best estimate of Turkey's population? Now, I don't want you to go to the internet to try to find the answers to these, but what would be your answer? It's very likely that the number 35 million in the first question influences the answer for the second question, regardless if it is accurate. This was an experiment that was conducted on different groups of people, and they were asked these two questions in this series. The researchers also asked this question sometimes in a different way. Instead of saying the number 35 million in the first question, they said the number 100 million in the first question. And in every case, every time that the larger number was used, the answers to the second question increased by many millions. This is an example of what is known as the anchoring trap. And that's the tendency for us to rely too heavily on the first information that we receive. Sometimes people use such techniques to manipulate you either intentionally or accidentally. A colleague might be arguing that uh, three of your biggest competitors are growing through different types of acquisitions and then ask if, if we should proceed with an acquisition. Now, if it's a standalone question like this, it seems like it's a pretty obvious way of trying to manipulate you. But if you imagine this happening in a steady flow of information through long meetings or over a longer period of time, it's harder to isolate that this is actually occurring. This happens in the media. We're constantly bombarded by information, and these bits of information, uh, whether they're accurate or not, sometimes will anchor us to different types of solutions or opinions. In another classic experiment, French researchers colored a white wine red with an odorless dye and asked a panel of wine experts to describe its taste. The connoisseurs described the wine using typical red wine descriptors rather than terms that they would use to evaluate white wine suggesting that the color played a significant role in the way that they perceived the drink. The first bit of information, the color of the wine that they saw, anchored them to thinking about the problem, thinking about the, 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 the wine in terms of red wine. A couple of things that we can do to deal with the anchoring trap. Make sure that you always view a problem from different perspectives and think about the problem on your own first. Also, think about uh, being careful when you are getting advice from different people to avoid anchoring your advisors and your consultants. In the status quo trap, people resist changes and thus decision makers usually have a strong bias toward alternatives that prolong the status quo. In one experiment, a group of people were randomly given one of two equal valued gifts. They were then told that they could effortlessly exchange one gift for the other. Logic would tell us that about half of the people would not be getting the, the gift that they had preferred and would therefore exchange it, but in fact, only 10% did. The U.S. states of New Jersey and Pennsylvania inadvertently ran a real-life experiment providing evidence of the status quo bias in the early 90s. As a part of tort law reform programs, citizens were offered two options for their automotive insurance, an expensive option giving them full right to sue and a less expensive option with restricted rights. In New Jersey, the cheaper option was the default one, and most citizens selected it. Only very few chose the cheaper option in Pennsylvania, however, and that was because the more expensive option was the default. Similar status quo effects have been shown for contributions to retirement plans, the choice of internet privacy policies, and the decisions to become organ donors. To help avoid the status quo trap, Ask yourself, would you choose the status quo alternative if, in fact, it weren't the status quo? Also, avoid exaggerating the effort or cost involved in switching from the status quo. And please remember, if you have several alternatives that are superior to the status quo, don't default to the status quo just because you're having a hard time picking the best alternative. By sticking with the status quo, you are making an active decision for an inferior option in this case. The first step in making a decision is to frame the question. It is also one of the most dangerous steps. The framing trap is the tendency of decision makers to be influenced by the way that a situation or problem is presented. For example, a new medical treatment with a 95% survival rate sounds much more promising than one with a 5% mortality rate. While both of these statistics tell you the same thing, framing the medical treatment in terms of survival as opposed to mortality sounds much better. 
In a similar way, customers tend to prefer a statement such as, this new food product is 90% fat free, as opposed to hearing about a product that's 10% fat. To help you avoid the framing trap, always try to reframe the problem in various ways and look for distortions caused by the frames. And when others are recommending decisions, examine the way that they framed the problem and challenge them with different frames. The confirming evidence trap. This is the bias that leads us to seek out and interpret information that supports our existing opinion while avoiding information that contradicts it. So this is an interesting study here. Two groups were asked to read two articles on capital punishment. Now one of these groups was uh, already in favor of capital punishment and the other group was not. And of the two articles, one with about the same level of scholarly effort and, and so on, concluded that the death penalty was an effective technique for reducing crime, while the other article concluded it was not an effective technique for reducing crime. Interestingly, after having received this mixed information, both groups were even more convinced that their own position was correct. Somewhat counterintuitive, you would think if you hear good information supporting your position and good information that is um, against your position, that this make you step back and rethink your position. But essentially what these individuals did and what we have a tendency to do is to accept the information that supports our own position as factual and then dismiss any of the conflicting information. In order to keep yourself from falling into the confirming evidence trap, make sure that you expose yourself to conflicting information Examine all evidence with equal rigor and know what you're about. Are you more interested in making good decisions or are you just looking for reassurance? Get someone that you respect to play devil's advocate and argue against the decision that you're making. And make sure not to ask leading questions that invite confirming evidence or anchor your advisors and consultants. Okay, here's another one. So imagine that you pre-ordered a non-refundable ticket to a basketball game. And then on the night of the game, you're tired and there's a blizzard raging. You regret buying the ticket because, frankly, you would prefer to stay at home, light up your fireplace, and comfortably watch the game on TV. What would you do? So I've asked this question to students before and in class, and uh, they'll ask me questions. Well, how much money did I spend on the ticket? And, you know, etc. So, you know, just to answer that question, let's say you spent a lot of money on the, on, the, on the ticket. So, I don't know, $200. A lot of money. So what do you do in this situation? Well, in this case, staying at home is actually the best choice. You regret having bought the ticket. And in your, you, know, you don't want to waste that money. But the thing is that the money is already gone regardless of your choice. That is a sunk cost, and it shouldn't influence your decision. The sunk cost trap is the tendency to make a choice in a way that justifies our past choices, even when the past choices no longer seem valid. So there are several ways to avoid the sunk cost trap. Make sure that you seek out views of people who were uninvolved with that earlier decision and are unlikely to be committed to those decisions. Also, focus on your goals. We make decisions in order to reach goals. So don't become attached to the particular series of steps that you took towards the goals. Always consider how can you better fulfill that goal from now on. Some of you are going to become leaders in industry and, and maybe you already have people working for you. Uh, make sure that not only do you do this for yourself, but you do this for others. So don't cultivate a failure-fearing culture that leads your employees to continue their mistakes. Not only you, but your team needs to be able to, to admit those mistakes and make the right decisions going forward. Make sure that they're not just continuing to make bad investment after bad investment or bad choice after bad choice to justify their past decisions. The conformity trap. Researchers ask students a series of very simple questions. So this is a pretty interesting experiment. So these are very simple questions. Most of the people uh, that were asked these questions got the answers right. There was only a 1% error rate. In another group, they asked the same simple questions, but this time, actors posing as students purposefully stated the wrong answers. What do you think happened? The error rate to jump to 33% on these very simple questions just because other people were saying the wrong answer and I guess saying the wrong answer confidently. 
this herd instinct exists to different degrees in all of us, and we should be aware of it. Even if we hate to admit it, other people's actions do heavily influence ours. Experiments have been conducted where groups of people were placed in a large hall and not allowed to communicate with each other. A select few received information about where to walk or where to go or, or what to do. And every time this experiment was performed, the informed individuals were followed by others in the crowd who formed a sort of a self-organizing snake-like structure and follow these guys around. And in most cases, the followers did not even realize they were being led by others. They performed this experiment many times and found that as the size of the crowd increases, the necessary ratio of informed individuals decreases. And researchers discovered that it takes a minority of just 5% to influence a crowd's direction, and the other 95% follow it without realizing it. So what can you do about this? Besides recognizing this is a tendency that we have, make sure that you're able to form your own opinion. Be well informed, take time to think about your decisions, and don't be afraid to be different. In summary, be courageous. This is one of the qualitative aspects of being a data scientist that I think is extremely important. Not just the skills in programming and the skills of using a variety of mathematical methods, but the ability to be able to find that key insight in the data and the results that, that nobody else has seen before. That's something that's different and meaningful and not being scared to, uh, to present that based upon the, the scientific and statistical evidence that you have. You have an advantage over a lot of people in that you can interpret the data that, that they don't have access to or they don't know how to deal with. From that vantage point, you can be a leader and you should be a leader on helping to make good decisions. Let me leave you with a last thought here. This is a quote that's been attributed to Albert Einstein. However, it's most likely not Albert Einstein. Any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent, but it takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. So I appreciate your time and effort that you've put into this class. Thank you for uh, working so hard on those homework assignments. Remember, in my opinion, the intelligent part of data analytics is not about the systems, not about the computers, not about the, the mathematics and, the, and, and uh, the techniques that are available, but the intelligent part is about you, about your insight, about your decisions, about your recommendations. So I hope you can take that and do something with it. Finally, last quote, also probably not from Einstein, logic will get you from A to Z, but imagination will get you everywhere. Thank you, and I hope you've enjoyed this course.